For most, life and existence remain as great and unexplainable mysteries. And yet, while it seems we are wandering aimlessly through time and space, there is a pattern and a design. We are heading in a direction and toward a conclusion, and there are answers to our deepest questions, perplexities, and curiosities. If we just take the time, we can discover them by following the footprints of our ancestors left in the sands of ancient history. This is the Colosseum, one of the world's most recognizable structures. In its time, it was a functional arena of blood sports. When it was completed in the year 80 AD, the Colosseum bookmarked for all time what has become the most enduring symbol of the fabulous Roman Empire. But while the Colosseum recorded in human history the nature and spirit of those times, few have realized that only 10 years later in the year 90 AD, God himself would hand down to a simple fisherman from Galilee the most remarkable, the most incomprehensible prophecy of the future of the human race. His name, the Apostle John. The writing, the Apocalypse. Since the inscribing of the apocalyptic warning, men throughout the Christian age have been trying, at their own peril and with little success, to pry into the exact meaning of the codes and symbols of this astonishing and perplexing book. The fact of the matter is that much of the interpretation of these veiled codes must be understood in the light of human history, and therefore must be distilled out as we sift through the sands of time. Journey with us as we travel through time and space, traversing the ancient ages, seeking to uncover the exact meaning of the two most mysterious figures of the apocalypse, the beast and the false prophet. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. And here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is yet to come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven. What are we to make of this riddle? The interpretation of the riddle strangely begins here in San Francisco. The nations of the world were weary, shaken to their foundations, and humbled to submission by the devastation and catastrophic effects of World War II, were willing and eager in their quest for world peace to surrender a degree of their national sovereignty to the grand idea of a new world governing body the United Nations. Here they sailed in 1945 ships from the four corners of the globe under this famous bridge to San Francisco where they put hand to pen and signed on to the charter of the United Nations. The golden gateway to the new world order and the eighth head of the beast of the apocalypse. Having spent more than two decades unlocking and decoding the secrets of these ancient mysteries is author and film producer Ken Klein. There are some absolutes that we can know and be certain about as it pertains to where everything's going. There is a predictable, absolutely certain finality that will come as the result of the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of lawlessness running its full course. It, it's, it's as certain as gravity. We know that we live in a world that isn't just having evil about, but it's a, it's a malignant evil. It's an evil that is driving the world to a conclusion, a, 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 an apocalyptic conclusion. Now, if you're a student of the Word and you understand Thessalonians, it says to us, and we, have this, we can appropriate this promise, that though the world will be taken as a thief in the night, the world won't understand the coming of the Lord. They, they just, it'll come on a bike suddenly, like a thief in the night. 
The Scripture promises us that believe in the Lord Jesus that that day will not overtake us as a thief. We will see it coming. There's some signs that you can be looking for that will indicate the nearness of my coming. Now, you've read Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark. You've read about, you know, the earthquakes and the famine. Okay, we're tired of that, those signs. All right, we got that, right? We got the earthquakes and the famine. We know that. Amen? Shake your head. I know that one, yeah. Don't give me the earthquake routine again. But tonight I want to talk to you about a sign that you've never seen. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm telling you these things now so that when it comes to pass, you know that I spoke. The whole motive for prophecy is to de develop our faith. Well, I'm telling you now so that when it comes to pass, you'll see that I spoke and it's going to minister to your faith. And so tonight, I'm going to bring you to a sign probably the most astounding sign you've ever heard or seen in your experience in the Lord in relationship to the awesome time of His return. I want you to turn with me to Revelation 13. This scripture has to do with the great beasts of the Bible. Revelation 13 talks about two beasts, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, you can just listen to me and then we're gonna read together. This first beast is a beast that comes up out of the sea. That beast has seven heads and ten horns. And then later, there's a second beast that comes up out of the earth. And this beast has two horns, it looks like a lamb, and it speaks like a dragon. Now tonight, we're going to be studying Revelation 13, 11, the second beast. Now, I want to ask you a question. I do this wherever I go. Apart from my book, and I wrote a book on this called The False Prophet, because that's what this second beast is called later in Revelation. Apart from my book, I'm, I'm, going, to take, I'm going to poll you here. How many of you have ever heard or read a book, apart from mine? Mine doesn't count. If you read my book, you don't cheat here. How many of you ever have heard any preaching or teaching on the second beast of Revelation 13? Raise your hand. Really, maybe out of this crowd, maybe 50 people. There's probably, I don't know, what, 800 or 1,000 people here? I don't know. I can tell you that's, that's a lot. But think about how many don't. Think about the 750 that have never heard. Now, when I travel the country and speak on this issue, I'm telling you that about 2% of the people respond, which means 98% of the people have never heard. Now, would you say that's a fair amount of people that are in the dark about something this significant? Wouldn't you say? And so basically, for thousands of years, we've been sitting here not knowing anything about, or very little, about this scripture. But tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open this up to you because it literally is the missing piece that will help flesh out your Christian worldview. Your worldview. Okay? And that's what we're working on tonight. That's where Satan's fighting today, is on our worldview, our Christian worldview. It's being eroded. That's where the attack is today. Okay. Now, let's read together these eight or nine scriptures in Revelation 13, 11. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the authority. You might want to put a circle around that word all. I'm going to come back to it later. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And there was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one 
should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of, the right translation should say the number is that of man, not a man, but man. The number is that of man. And his number is 666. Now, uh, for a couple of years, I had the privilege of playing professional football. I played with the 49ers, and I played with the Houston Oilers, and it was a lot of fun. But the thing I got out of it that fits tonight is that when we, whenever we were ready to play an opposing team, they would give us a scouting report about a half an inch thick. And in that scouting report, we would know all of their personnel. We would know all the tendencies. They'd run this stuff through computers, and we'd chart the tendencies and the personality traits of every team so we knew what they do in any given situation. That's how they trained you. And it was a very difficult mental thing that you had to go through each week to get ready for your opponent, the one that would oppose you. When it comes to ministry, when it comes to walking with the Lord, when it comes to spiritual warfare, you must know what your adversary is doing if you expect to fight a good fight. Amen? And we are called to not only fight a good fight, we are called to win. Hallelujah. We win. But we have to fight. And many people are defeated because they can't see. They can't see where they're at. They can't understand the arena they're in. They don't know what's going on. And so they kind of walk in defeat. And, and we need to know what our adversary is doing. So let me go over a few fundamentals with you concerning him. Number one, before he was thrown down into this world and became the god of this world, he was known as Lucifer. He was the most incredible creature God ever made. He had the most uh, amazing voice. He was full of wisdom. He was full of knowledge. Uh, he was beautiful. He had it all. And he was God's right-hand guy. And you know the story. Before man was created, there was a conflict in the eternal realm where he tried to usurp the throne of God and God's holy mountain, God's government. And for that rebellion, he was cast into this world. Now, when he was thrown into this world, he has brought with him that same agenda. To set up a government and to seat himself on a throne somehow. That, that's what's happening on earth. That has been what's happening for 6,000 years. That is the backdrop in which we live. And for unregenerate man, where he lives. And so as you track through history, as you track through, you can see the outplaying of this agenda. There is a conspiracy. It is a satanic conspiracy to take over the world politically legally, and for there to in, in one day be an, uh, uh, an ambassador of some sort in the Antichrist who will sit on a throne and be Lucifer or Satan's representative over that system. That's where it's going. You can lock into that. You can put that in the bank. That is what this world's all about. Now on the other side, there's God collecting and has been since the time of Adam, his kingdom. The called out ones, the church, the Old Testament saints that are under the blood because Jesus preached to them when he went to the belly of the earth. That's part of our family. And the New Testament people that come under the new covenant. That's, he's been calling out a people. We don't know who they are. That's why we preach to everybody. They're elected. The elect of God. That's who you are. And we're not part of that group that is in darkness. But that is what his agenda is. Now, this can be seen... This plan and this agenda can be seen in the book of Revelation, but it's encrypted. This information and knowledge is encrypted in symbolism. Okay? Like, uh, you heard the Morse code. Dot, dash, dot, or dash, dot. What is the SOS? Dash, dot, or dot, dash, dot is the old uh, code for SOS, save our ship. SOS is the information that is transmitted through a code. Well, in the book of Revelation, we have symbolism that wants to be expressed. It's a code, and it has to be de-encrypted. It's got to be interpreted. And so you have to have somebody that understands how to do that 
so that we understand the meaning of those symbols. Uh, am I, are you, go like this, because you look like a bunch of deer. <laughs> John sees a beast coming up out of the sea, and it has seven heads, and it has ten horns. And behind it is this dragon that gives it its power, and then eventually it stands on the seashore. So not only do we see this incredible thing, but we have, there's some movement to it. It's emerging out of a sea, and then eventually it steps on the shore. And we have a preview of this beast in the book of Daniel, around the 8th chapter, 7th or 8th chapter, where Daniel sees the same beast coming up out of the sea, and it has ten horns, but he, Daniel doesn't see the seven heads. Instead, he sees a little horn. And so we have so, something that's similar to what John sees, a little bit different. And uh, it speaks of a government. Because earlier in Daniel, we, he sees four beasts, and they're explained as governments. And they're explained as beasts because they're, they are Gentile-controlled empires without the rule of God. And so they're characterized as wild beasts. So we know that the beast in the Bible is a, is a political system. It's an empire. Now you have to ask yourself the question, why did the Lord, the Spirit, record the beast in, with two different views? Now we're talking about the first beast, and I'll, I'll get to the second beast in just a minute. But I want you to see how in the beasts you see the agenda of Satan. Why did Daniel see ten horns and a little horn, and John see ten horns and seven heads? How come there's a difference? One of the answers that I have for that is because the Lord wanted to make sure that we would differentiate between the Antichrist, as it's seen as a little horn coming up amongst the ten, and Daniel's view to the end of the world, which he saw this thing manifest, and John's view, where he doesn't see the Antichrist, but sees a panorama of this system that begins back by the time of the Egyptians and works its way through all of through time. See, the beast of Revelation 13 is not just something in the future. Anybody that tells you that hasn't read Revelation 17, where it really explains a little bit more about the beast, and you don't have to go there, but let me tell you. It says, let me tell you the mystery of the beast, the woman and the beast, that has the seven heads and the ten horns. The seven heads are seven mountains. A mountain in the Bible is a kingdom. In fact, it says it in the next verse, and the seven mountains are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and one is about to come. So the five fallen heads were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece. It's all the possible, it's all possible, the only possibility. The sixth was the Roman Empire. Then there'd be a seventh, and out of the seventh would come an eighth. So we see this, the symbolism explains this system that Satan has been building for 5,000 years. So John shows us this panorama of the beast. Daniel looks from his time to the end of the world and sees the ten horns and he sees the Antichrist come and take dominion over the beast. So there really is a separation between the beast and the Antichrist and it's very important, very, very important that you draw the distinction because the church has been taught that the Antichrist is the beast and it's not true. Otherwise, how do you explain the two visions? So don't mistake it, because in getting to unlock the truth about the second beast, we have to come to the conclusion that the beast is not a man, but the beast is a system. Are you with me? Because it takes some work to see this. It took me eight years. This didn't happen, you know, one night after I had a bad pepperoni pizza. I mean, this, <laughs> this was a lot of work. So we have to draw the distinction between the Antichrist, who is a man, and the Bible has a lot other scriptures. We, we find in, in Daniel 11, more talk about the Antichrist. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about the man of lawlessness, and even in John, and also Zechariah 12, we find out more information about the Antichrist. There will, it seems, scripture weight leans towards a man who will take control over that system. Okay? And so Satan has been building this throughout the ages. It's not some end time thing, it's something that's been under construction for a long time 
That's been his agenda. That's been his plan. That's what he's been working for, starting with the Egyptian Empire, taking from that and improving to the next, the Assyrian, then to the Babylonian, then to the Medo-Persian, then to the Greek Empire, then to the Roman Empire. All right. That's his agenda. The question is, how does the second beast factor in to that agenda? We're going to cover four points tonight. Number one, we're going to find out what is the purpose of this second beast called the false prophet and, they, and that satanic agenda. Okay? Number two, we're going to find out tonight when he appears in time. Historical time. There's a time when he appears. You know, when Caesar Augustus made the decree that there'd be a census, and Mary, who was nine months pregnant with the Lord, had to make that 100-mile trip from, from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem, they had no idea they were fulfilling biblical prophecy that he would be born in Bethlehem. A lot of things that go on, we, can't, we don't see it. But nevertheless, there came a time when Bible prophecy was fulfilled. This doesn't just go on and on and on where we don't have the manifested prophetic happening occur. So this false prophet appears at a certain point in time. We're going to find out that's the second point tonight. The third point is we're going to find out how he operates so we can track him. And the fourth point tonight, I know, I know you're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you who he is. Okay? Do you need to get a glass of water or anything? Or? <laughs> All right, let's start with the first thing. The purpose of this second beast in the satanic agenda. Now I guarantee you, when you see this tonight, you're going to have a greater sense of the eminence of the, of the Lord's return. And I saw another beast, in verse 11, come out of the earth. And down to verse 16 it says, And he, this second beast, causes the whole world, he causes the whole world. Now we're talking about you too. Even though you're... You're, you're in it and not of it. You're still part of what he's causing to happen here. He causes the whole world to follow after the system. He causes the whole world to follow after the system that has been gathering momentum since the time of the Egyptian Empire. And, is, and, and, and so that's why when it says, well, who can go to war with the beast? Well, if something's like a big iceberg, you know, you can't just put your hand against that thing and think that by your little puny hand you're going to stop something that massive. We're talking about a system that Satan has built that is so pervasive and so powerful that the saints can't stop it. Now, I know we're going to get a lot of arguments about this. We may not be able to stop it, but we don't have to let it affect us. We have victory over it, even though it may kill us. I mean, that's not that right? That, tell that to somebody that's not saved. <laughs> what are you, nuts? I mean, what, what's the worst thing that happened? I go home. I mean, I, I win. The purpose, then, is to cause the whole world to track after this system. Now, you look at some of the things that have occurred in the last few years about the New World Order, and that's not kind of a negative word, thanks to uh, Hulk Hogan and all the stupid things that he makes jokes about, and it's kind of, you know, now let's not use that term anymore. It's been, it's been debunked, and it's this foolishness. But there really is, there really is the political apparatus set in place for a global world government whether you want to call it New World Order or something else, I call it the beast, because that's what the Bible calls it. Okay? That's the job of the false prophet. He's kind of like the finished carpenter that comes into the house and nails up the trim 
and puts everything in place. He's, he comes out at a certain time and he kind of finishes what's been in motion for thousands of years. He's the last agency that comes to finish the agenda. Okay? And I'm going to give you more facts of just how tight this thing is already wrapped up in just a minute. The, the second point about this second beast called the false prophet is that he appears at a specific point in history. It's, this isn't some uh, mythological idea. This is a reality that manifests. Just like Jesus was born of a virgin. He was, it was prophesied about. This is, this is a prophetic utterance. It's going to happen. When? Okay, when is it? The scripture tells us in the 17th chapter of Revelation, and I just mentioned it, let me tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast upon which she sits and the heads of that beast. Five have fallen. When Nimrod conquered the world, one of the places he came to to set up his kingdom was Egypt. And of all of the empires of the world, Egypt is probably more mirror-like to the ancient Babylonian Nimrod Babylon than any other empire of the world. But Egypt remains the first head on the great beast of Revelation 13. I saw a great beast come up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. Egypt is the first head of those heads on the great symbolic beast of John's beast, Revelation 13. The Assyrian king was known as the great king, the legitimate king, the king of the whole world. Assyria's kings led a proud and cruel and warlike race, and Assyria was a mighty power for hundreds of years. She welded all the peoples of the Mediterranean into a great empire and finally came to her end and fell from prominence in 606 B.C. Babylon emerged as a world ruler in 600 B.C. In her greatness, she is still remembered to this day for her hanging gardens and massive impregnable walls. But her pride in her own greatness was her downfall. For in only one day she was invaded by the Medes and Persians and brought down as they diverted the river Euphrates and crept in under the walls through the city's aqueducts. In the latter part of the 6th century B.C., the ancient history of the Near and Middle East culminated in the establishing of the Medo-Persian Empire by Cyrus and Darius the Great. The empire included most of the known world and lasted for over 200 years when it was finally conquered by the Greeks. In short order, the greatest military genius of all time, Alexander the Great, conquered the known world and set up the birthplace of Western civilization, Greece. It was Greece who gave us the great philosophers of Plato and Aristotle. They gave us phenomenal developments in architecture, medicine, and science. And yet, in all their advancements, they still clung to their ignorance and worshipped many of the pagan traditions and many of their gods. Five have fallen, John, and one is. And that was the Roman Empire. It was the empire that was in existence during the time when the Lord lived and was crucified, as you know, you should know. The empire, begun according to tradition by the twin brothers Romulus and Remus, two shepherd boys, grew from a small community along the Tiber River to an enormous and yet restless empire never seeming to be content with its size. It must be remembered for its gross brutality, not only in war, but in peace, as it relished in the spectacle of sanctioned murder in its gladiatorial games which took place here in the great Colosseum. And then the Lord says to John, and John, there's going to be a seventh out in the future. Five have fallen, one is, and one is about to come. And then that seventh head will be slain, and out of that slain head will be an eighth. That's what it says there in Revelation 17. Now, here's how dumb we are. Forgive me. But the church has believed for I don't know how many decades, and I'm saved almost 30 years now, that the Antichrist would receive a fatal head wound, and then there would be some kind of satanic resurrection, 
and then he would be so messed up by the satanic resurrection that he would end up being the Antichrist. There'd be some man in power, this would happen to him, and there'd be a satanic resurrection. And so in the 60s, everybody thought it was John F. Kennedy. I mean, he was a Catholic. <laughs> That's what the Protestants thought. I mean, you, if you're any great, we have a lot of young people here, but the gray-head people and people that are getting one of these halos. <laughs> Remember that? And everybody watched to see. Boom, he gets shot in the head. And the world mourned, and every, all, the, all the, the prophetic people were watching. He's going to come back. This is it. This is, a, this is where the prophecies fulfilled. This is it. Nothing. So the, 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 the people that were assuming that JFK was the guy said, no, it couldn't be him. He didn't come back. It must be the Kennedy headline. So everybody was looking at Bobby. <laughs> right? Sirhan, Sirhan. Boom. Bobby Kennedy goes down in L.A. He didn't come back either. So everybody, all the Christians looked down the bench, and there he was, Teddy. <laughs> Forget it, man, he ain't, he ain't got it. <laughs> then they started looking at Gorbachev. Remember the spot on his head? <laughs> Am I right? And since Gorbachev, nobody's really thought about it anymore. Listen to me. When Jesus died and he went into the belly of the earth, guess what he got? The keys to death. There is no one except the living Son of God that can raise anybody from the dead. Amen. Satan can't do it. Forget it. The problem is the church has been listening to this nonsense, looking over here for a man, and the Lord isn't even talking about a man. If you look at the succession of empires, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and there'll be a seventh, why isn't that seventh also an empire? How come it changes from empires to a man in contemporary theology? And the answer is it's a mistake. It should also be an empire. And an empire will be slain, and out of that slain empire comes an eighth. That's the way you read the Bible contextually. It's not talking about a man being slain. It's talking about an empire being slain. And I'm here to tell you tonight that there's only one empire that fits it in the history of the world since the time of the Romans. Okay, tell us. Because it's already been slain. We're well into the Eighth Empire. The Eighth Empire is on. It's, we're, it, we're into it already. Let me read to you something. See if you recognize this. Listen. This was written about 300 years ago. Oh, not quite. When in the, actually, a little over 200 years ago. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume the powers of the earth, a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to that separation. And that is the what? The Declaration of Independence. Now remember I was telling you that the beast has been with us for thousands of years. The beast existed during the time of Jesus. The beast existed for the last 2,000 years. Our founding fathers were trying to break out of the grip of the seventh head. British Empire. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the beast that was, was not. For over 1,000 years, there was no dominant world empire. Until around the 1600s, the seventh head, the British Empire, began to emerge. Behind me is the seat of the British Empire, Buckingham Palace. The British Empire set up in the 1600s the banking system, it was called the Bank of England, and every central bank in the world, every central bank in every country of the world functions with the same principles of the Bank of England, and it's called the fractional reserve banking. Now, let me tell you how it works. You go to the bank, you put $100 in the bank, guess what, they loan out about 98% of it. They only keep a fraction back. In the old days, they used to take in gold and issue notes. And they found out people didn't want to carry the gold around. They just traded the notes and sold the notes. That was the first money, the first paper money. 
And so the goldsmith said, you know, these people don't know. We just issue a few more notes called inflation. That's what they do today, in case you didn't know that. And that's how they began to make a lie out of the truth. And you put your money in, they'll issue more notes than there is backing. And today, they don't even have gold backing. They just issue paper, paper, paper. And we're papered to death. It's inflation. That's how to destroy a nation. In fact, when nations go to war against other nations, you know how they attack them? They just print their money and flood it, and they destroy their economic system. America's been known to do that a little bit. We do it pretty good. We have really good printing presses. We're experts at that. The Bank of England was set up. The bank that would take over the world. The world banking system is based upon the Bank of England. Also, the British set up an amazing system of warfare through the East India Company. And they terrorized China, but Hong Kong was controlled by the British for, for, for a long time. And the Chinese tried to break out of that grip in 1850 through the famous Opium Wars, but the British flooded opium into China to keep all the Chinese people loaded. <laughs> the British also controlled India and killed millions of Indians, made them slaves. The British were also responsible for the slave trade in, into the United States. In fact, our banking system today was funded by slave money, piracy, and drugs. That's where the money came to capitalize the American banking system. We don't know this because, you know, they don't write about this in your history books. In 1815, a, a great battle took place called the Battle of Waterloo. That's all you know about it. There was a battle called Waterloo, and you know that Napoleon was there, and the British prevailed. And what was at stake there was who was going to control the mainland of Europe. But there were some really interesting bankers there, and then they found out who was going to win, and they were called the Rothschilds. They sold out their stock on the market. Everybody thought they knew that the French had won. The market tumbled. There was a massive sell-off, and the Rothschilds agents were buying up all the stock on the bottom at five cents on the dollar, and overnight they became the controllers of the Bank of England. Now, those folks that gained control of that bank have also been accused of a Jewish conspiracy. You've probably heard about that, especially in the last couple of years. It's been a strong teaching. And Hitler was reacting to that later. But from the time of 1815 to the outbreak of World War II, Brit the British Empire ruled the world, without a doubt, no rivals, up until 1914. Now, I'm taking you through a lot of history, but so walk with me, because you never heard it like this before. 1914, uh, World War I broke out. Britain was in trouble. The United States came in, bailed them out. The war ended in 1919 or so, uh, or earlier. And then it was reignited in 1939 when Hitler invaded uh, Austria and Poland, and World War II was on. When the World War II was over, so was the British Empire. It had been slain. The seventh head on the beast there's only one possibility for it, is the British Empire. These people terrorized Americans. They threw them in jail. They wouldn't give us uh, redress in court. They, they totally plundered the seas and took Americans captive on the high seas and made them slaves. It was terrible. They were the beast. They were the beast at that time. And our founding fathers were trying to break out of the grip of the seventh head. They, were trying, they didn't know it. I don't think they knew it. I don't think they knew prophecy. They couldn't have understood this. But they were trying to get away for religious freedom and to have the, the ability to have their own land. They were trying to break out of the feudal system, and they came to a new place. And they thought it was the New Jerusalem. In fact, you can read that in their writings. They actually thought that America is the New Jerusalem. It's not the New Jerusalem. I, don't, I know it says J-E-R-U-S-A in Jerusalem. That's just nonsense. America is not the New Jerusalem. I have people tell me that all the time. I'm just, you know, get a life. Shoot. The point of it is that the seventh head was slain in 1945. At the end, there was no more. What emerged in 1945, coming out of the seven, was the eighth head called the United Nations. The United Nations is the eighth head on the beast. Now, the point I'm trying to make here to you is the second point. What is the timing of the second beast? And the timing is that he appears at the time of a fatal head wound and the resurrection thereof. That means... The false prophet has been with us for over 50 years. And we're sleeping, looking for the slain head over here, not seeing that we've already passed by it. You with me? Yes. 
Okay, good job. I thought you did good on that one. Now, I want to take you into the third point. If the false prophet is causing the whole world to follow after the beast, the system, how is he doing it? So well. And the scripture tells us he has three power systems, three, they're called miracle powers, attesting miracles. Three powers. Let me tell you what they are, and I'm going to go through them with you so that you can see it real clearly. Number one, it says he's able to call down fire from heaven in the presence of men. Number two, he makes an image. He gives it life. He makes an image of the beast. He gives it life, and the whole world worships it. That's number two, power system. Number three, he makes a mark without which no one can buy or sell. Now, when you look into the third aspect, which is the most talked about part, by the way, look who's doing that. The false prophet is the one that makes the mark of the beast. The Antichrist doesn't do it, and the beast doesn't do it. The false prophet does it. He's the one behind that. So it's important to discern him and perceive him in the spirit, wouldn't you say? Amen? But when you look at the third system that he has, or a miracle, it's obviously some kind of technological marvel to, to change the whole world's money system. And because we have some window of insight into that, because there's a little bit more information given about that than the other two signs, it's really logical and not unfair to assume that the other two signs are also technological signs. Now, I got on an airplane. I know that, I know that uh, Philip, when he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, was transmitted you know, to another city. It's like, somehow, it was weird. Uh, but I got on an airplane in Portland a few days ago, and I flew, I was three and a half hours. And every time I get on an airplane, I go, you know, we've only been doing this for about 100 years, less, flying. Every day you see planes going, oh, that's a plane. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have a Harley hog and drive down the Appian Way in Greece during the time of Paul? <laughs> Whoa! What is that, man? Oh, we take it for granted now. But, I mean, those people would have been like, they would have run. They would have fled. They would have thought you were one of, uh, Zeus or somebody coming down. <laughs> Do you know most of, the, most of the most amazing technologies that have ever been invented have happened within the last, inside of 100 years, the last 100 years, which is a very small sliver of time. Now, during the turn of the century, the Wright brothers, of course, Orville and Wilbur, discovered the principles of flight, how the Bernoulli's curve, I think they call it, caused lift in an airplane wing. And, and they invented, or they discovered the principles of flight. It was always there. Nobody knew about it. It happened later. Now, why, why did God hold back on technology for so long? When you read some of the amazing political statements of the Founding Fathers, I think they were smarter than us. They had a greater character, greater morality. I mean, it just, I read some of the statements in, the, in some of the writings of these men. I go, man, these people were brilliant. How come we didn't have technology then? And I think the answer is that if God had opened up that any sooner, uh, he wouldn't have had enough time to collect enough people for salvation because the truth of the matter is what God means for good, man takes and uses it for evil. And so if he gave us technology too soon, we would have wiped the world out long ago. <laughs> so he held back on that stuff, and now we kind of take it for granted. But when the Wright brothers discovered flight, it wasn't 10 years until they were dropping <laughs> bombs out of airplanes. Within 10 years, let's use it to kill people. <laughs> That's the best we could come up with. <laughs> and then as flight became more and more developed, so did the weapon systems. 
until now, Lord knows what we got. Did you notice the last time we sent people to the Gulf, we sent three quarters of a million men. Now there's like about 10,000 or so, or 30,000. My God, what do they have that they haven't told us about now? What kind of super weapons have they developed? Because you know they've developed smarter bombs than the smart bombs they used in 1991. And if you think that we haven't developed fire from heaven yet, go talk to the Japanese who got nuked. Or the Vietnamese and the firestorms, or the Germans. When firestorms destroyed, they snuffed out the air, they were so hot. Fire from heaven is in the hand of the false prophet. It's military high technology. Because if you're going to control the world, you have to have the high ground and you have to have military tech to control the nations. The false prophets got it. Okay? The second thing that he designed is an image. And he makes an image of the beast. Now, the false prophet actually makes an image of the beast. Remember what the beast is? It's a what? Is it a man? It's a what? A system. How old's a system, folks? About 5,000 years old? What's this thing supposed to look like? How does the false prophet make an image of a system that's 5,000 years old? What is this image supposed to look like? The word there for image is not the word idol. It's not the word for uh, 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 like a statue. That's an idol. The word is the word icon in the Greek. Let me explain that word to you. They came to Jesus and they said, should we pay taxes? Kind of like what we asked today, right? <laughs> and the Lord said, give me that coin. Give me a coin. And he says, uh, whose icon is that? And they said Caesar's. And they rendered to Caesar's. What is Caesar's? Rendered to God. What is God's? The point being that the word icon means likeness. Not a vis-a-vis -vis idol, but a likeness. A similar, something similar to, but not a vis-a-vis -vis likeness. And then it goes on to say that this false prophet, this second beast, he breathes life into this icon. He breathes life. And the word there is not the word zo, which we get the word zoo from, animate life. Not animate life. It's not, the, the, the image of the beast is not a robot, you know, in, 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 in uh, the, the, the unbuilt temple in Jerusalem that we're all looking for. It's not some statue in the holy of holy places. Not, it's, that's not what it is. The word there that he uses for, for life is the word pneuma. It's, the word pneuma is the word we get spirit from. The false prophet gives this likeness spiritual life. What in the world does this thing look like? I mean, you sit there and you're just mystified. An image or a likeness of a 5,000-year-old system that has spiritual life. What could this possibly be? In 1948, when radio was the media of choice in the United States, a very interesting invention was foisted on the American public. It was called television. At the beginning, it was pretty much controlled by Christian values and morals. It was pretty milk toast. Over the last 50-some years, it's become more and more satanic. Television is spiritual. It has spiritual life to it. It is a reflection and likeness of the beast system. You can also include the screens of computers in with that statement. The television tube is an icon of the system that is programming the people of the world. The average TV is on 8 to 10 hours a day. If you're poor, it's on longer because it's the poor man's entertainment. And it is effectively programming a world citizenry.
television has shrunk the world and caused it to be a global commune. Ask Hillary Clinton, she'll tell you the same thing. It takes a village, a global village. And the world has become shrunk by the media of television. And all of us ought to, when we watch, and I'm not legalistic, I'm not here to say, well, throw, away, throw that away, because actually television, it actually does put you in a hypnotic state. It really does put you in an alpha brainwave pattern, same thing as hypnosis or driving down the highway. And when, when, when you watch television, it actually bypasses your rational grid work and goes right into your subconscious, because your spirit is your subconscious mind. So television actually goes into your spirit and shapes it and gives it its presuppositions and concepts. So you ought to be very careful if you decide to keep it what you watch. Okay? The false prophet makes an image of the system or an image of the beast. He gives it life and the whole world genuflects. Is that happening, folks? Yes. If you're going to control the world, you not only have to have military high tech to control the nations with a big stick, you also, ha you also have to have a world communication system to create a world citizenry. Television's done the job very effectively and it's getting now 500 channels. You can have 500 channels. Who wants it? But the last technological marvel is a mark. The false prophet will impose a system that he's been working on now for since the 1950s. And again, we haven't been paying attention. Now, let me talk to you about the universal product code. The idea had nothing to do with biblical prophecy. They weren't doing something evil. The idea was so that they can inventory supermarket products effectively and quickly. Because how would you like to be the stock boy that went into the supermarket to count what had been sold after every day's business transactions when there's 5,000 products in a supermarket? What a pain. So they came up with a concept of how to put numbers that identify products through this UPC code on products. And basically the way it works is with uh, several different types of characters. Some are longer than others. The ones on the end are long, there's one in the middle that's long, and there's some on the, on the right side that are, are uh, long. The shorter characters have numbers underneath of it. Do you see the 1600? And the bars above it are shorter than the bars on the left, the right, and the middle. And that's because the shorter bars are data character bars. They contain encrypted information in what is called binary. And the width of those bars are different. Notice right under the number 6 and 0 next to it, and under the 1600 there, there's a big fat dark bar. That has more modules, which is pluses and zeros and pluses and zeros, than, say, the thin white bar to the left or the right of it. And so these characters contain information that, when it's scanned, have a applied meaning. Now, the 1600 refers to a product ID number. Let's suppose it's ketchup. 1600 means ketchup, all right? On the right side of this uh, UPC code, 66210, let's suppose that's Heinz. 66210 means Heinz. The number of the name of the manufacturer is 66210. That's the number of the name of Heinz. The number of the product, and the name of the product is ketchup, which is 1600. Okay? So that's what those data characters mean. Now I want you to look at, on the right side, the two number sixes. Do you see those two sixes where it says 66210? Now I want you to measure with your eyes the widths of the, of the shorter bars above them. You see they're kind of uniform. There's a dark, a light, and a dark, and they're all about the same widths because the computer measures widths when it's scanned. It just measures the widths. Notice how both sixes are the same. Now take a look at the end bar on the left, the end bar on the right, and the middle one. Do you notice the similarity to the two sixes on the right side of the code? They're the same widths, although 
the bar on the end and the middle are longer. Let's go to the second. Uh, you see that? I've got a picture there of that six that you can now measure with your eyes in relationship to the other bars. Okay, can we have the next? Now, when the computer is uh, activated, it's activated by the longer bars. They are merely triggers that tell the computer to pick up the smaller uh, bars that are data. The computer, cannot, con con the computer cannot compute the data without those three guard bars. Those guard bars tell the computer to turn on, pick up the information, and turn off at speeds faster than the speed of light. The thing that I want you to see is that in the binary language here for uh, the number six, it's a light bar, a dark bar, a light bar, a light bar, a dark bar, a light bar, and a dark bar. And it's configured the same in binary language as the guard bars. OK, give me the next picture. So the three guard bars in binary language is the number six. You with me? And those are the bars that trigger picking up the data. All right, the next. And there you see the guard bars have no numbers under it, right? So if you were to look at a UPC code, you wouldn't know those guard bars are configured in binary language of the number six. And that's why it says, let him who has wisdom calculate the number of the system. The number of the beast is the number of the system. It's not the number of Henry Kissinger. It's not the number of Prince Charles. It's not the number of a specific man. It is the number of the beast. It is the number of the system. You with me? Because all these people are using numerology to try to uh, soothsay who the Antichrist is. This isn't even talking about the Antichrist. It's talking about the beast, the system. Let's keep it in context and not fly off trying to figure out things that can't be figured out from this scripture. This is the number of the system. Now, give me the next one, please. Now, let's talk about how this could be adapted for human use. So let's suppose we'll make you your own personalized Mark of the Beast number tonight. I'll make my own, because you don't get nervous. Number 110, and if you give it its equivalent binary numbers and, and bars, happens to be the corporate ID number of the United States of America. Okay? There's about, I don't know, 350 nations of the world. Everyone has a corporate ID number. They run all the nations like a corporation. Our corporate ID number is 110. So you give the corresponding uh, data in the bars, and there's a person now that lives. We know where that person lives. They live in the area of 110, a number. Now I put there, when I designed this, 619. It used to be the area code of San Diego. What's the area code here? <laughs> there are different ones? 708. So instead of 619 there, put 708. That would be your local computer. Now do you know that when they do ID checks on you to study your credit, to see if you're credit worthy, they do it through the telephone company? Because you cannot get a telephone number with a bogus name. It's all pegged to your, uh, your social security number. They'll know. If you say, well, I'm Joe Smith, well, you have to fill out the information to get a telephone number, and they'll know who you are. They won't issue you one. They check you out through the telephone company. So your local area code could go there. So this person lives in 110, which is the United States of America in binary language. The area of what we said was 708, which is Chicago. This person, we know exactly where they live. And now give me the next one if we have one more. Do we have any more? That's it? That must be it. OK, just try to imagine on the other side now, where there's blanks, put in your social security number. Mine is 555551025. So my personal mark of the beast number would be 110-619-5555-41025. And the way that that information is picked up is by the three sixes. So. It takes a six to activate the computer to pick up the binary information contained in the short bars. The next barcode that's longer there after the nine tells the computer to pick up my electronic banking number. And the last one says, shut it off. So now I go to the supermarket. I buy my crackers. I buy my 
Whatever I buy, they scan it, and then they scan my hand or my forehead, and they do an EFT, electronic funds transfer. Folks, the technology has been with us for some time. The not-so-ancient technological past of computerized supermarket inventory control, product and company information was and still is controlled and achieved by scanners passing over barcodes. But in the evolution of barcode technology, a new development has emerged that promises to answer society's greatest problems, RFID. RFID is the latest technological advancement that utilizes pulsating radio waves that are transmitted right from a barcode. What this advancement in technology means is that now a barcode has the capacity to send binary information through the air direct to a receiver, eliminating the need for scanners. Presently, the technology allows information to be transmitted over distances of several hundred yards. But in the future, the emitting of barcoded radio waves will no doubt span much greater distances. As illegal immigrants fill our prisons, crush our health care system, and destroy our economy, the cry from most Americans is reaching the ear of our politicians. But what? What is to be done? A wall? What about the 12 million illegals already here? In addition, the illegal immigration issue is complicated by the threat of terrorism. We have been warned by our politicians that it's not if, but when, we will be hit with another devastating 9-11 attack. But realistically, what can be done? And what about another grave crisis? Identity theft. A $50 billion a year problem and growing. How do we secure our precious personal information, such as social security numbers, checking accounts, credit cards, that seem so easily accessible to thieves? What is the answer to these perplexing and dangerous dilemmas? RFID will be the answer as it will do away with the present currency system which is the only way thieves, illegals, and terrorists can operate. RFID will set up a cashless society where every citizen's financial, medical, and social transactions are traceable and trackable by computer technology via sound waves emitted from barcodes. In one mighty fell swoop, Radio Frequency ID will conquer and overcome all these seemingly unsolvable problems. The future can be seen looming on the horizon. Those are the three power systems that the false prophet has. If you're going to control the world, you have to have military high tech, you have to have a worldwide computer system, a, a, a communication system, and you have to have a world banking system so we don't have all these floats in the currency. Do you think he's doing a good job? Is the whole world going this route? Absolutely. He causes the whole world to follow after the beast, the system. Now, I'm going to tell you who he is. You ready for this? Let's go back to the Word. I'm going to read you three scriptures and l listen to me. I don't believe in date setting. I don't set any dates. I don't know when the Lord's coming. I think it's soon, though. I don't believe in conjecture or speculation, especially with prophecy. What I'm about to tell you comes right out of the Bible. It's because the Bible, praise God, it interprets itself. There's no private interpretation of the Bible. You know what that means? That every doctrine, every single teaching of the Bible has to be examined in the light of the rest of the Bible. Everything has to come under the scrutiny of the whole weight of Scripture to be the truth. So there's no private interpretation. So I'm not just pulling this out of the air. I'm going to prove to you who he is scripturally. Okay? You think I can do it? So we're going into the fourth point. Now I want you to read with me in the 11th verse, And I saw another beast, and we've been talking about him, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Now, there are three clues, three major clues in those two scriptures that will help us come to grips with the identity of this second beast. Now, if you ask the average theologian today, Protestant, not Catholic, and by the way, I'm not here to defend the Catholic Church. After all, 
the Spanish Inquisition wiped out a lot of Jewish people. So there, it's not, I'm not here to, to, to lift them up or anything like that. I'm just here to tell you the truth. <clears throat> if you were to ask the average Protestant, many of you would say, who do you think the false prophet is? The first thing they would say, it's the Pope! <laughs> right? You know why they say that? They have nobody else to blame. <laughs> Who else is there? It's not the Pope. And I haven't been hired by the, you know, uh, <laughs> the Jesuit priesthood, you know. Why do they say that? Because the Bible says that this false prophet looks like a lamb. Speaks like a dragon. There's something about this false prophet that has some Christ-like external veneer to it. Because in the Old Testament, a lamb was a representation of the Lord. Abel offered up a lamb to God, and God said, that's a good sacrifice. And to Cain, he said, no. Abraham offered up a ram or a lamb at the sacrifice of his son Isaac, and it was acceptable to God. It was a substitution for his son. And the Jewish people, when they were in Egypt, were required to kill a lamb to stay the wrath of God on the tenth plague that was to hit the firstborn of all the Egyptians. And to this day, the Jewish people celebrate the Passover when the death angel passed over all their houses that had the blood of the lamb on their door. And then John the Baptist said, after the baptism of the Lord Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. So a lamb in the Bible is a, is a prefigurement, a type of Jesus. So here we have this thing looking like a lamb, but underneath of it, is, it speaks like a dragon. And so the Protestant says, it's the Pope. And that's why they say that, because of that very scripture. But it's not the Pope. Now, do you remember when we started reading this, I said to you, circle the word all? It says that this second beast, the false prophet, has all the power of the first beast, and that first beast is a system. So the, the second beast has all the power of the system. Now, think about that. What is the power of the beast system? Well, think of Pharaoh. By the way, this word for power is not the word dunamis that explains the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. It's talking about legal. In fact, that's the word, exousia, it's, the, it's a legal term. And it simply means that if I wanted to come into this state and get a driver's license, I'd have to pay a test, pay a little fee, and, and, and the governor of the state would say, okay, I legally give you the right to drive in this state. Legal power. That's the, that's the concept here. This, this false prophet has all the legal power of the first beast. Now, what was the legal power of Pharaoh? Was it religious? Somewhat, yeah. Was it power to print money? Yeah. To conscript for military duty? Yeah. Regulate trade? Yeah. Every sphere of human behavior was under the legal power of Pharaoh. Same thing for the Assyrian kings. Same thing for Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Same thing for the Medo-Persian king, Cyrus and Darius. Same things for Alexander the Great. Same things for the Romans. Same things for the king of England. Legal authority over every sphere of human endeavor. Huge, right? Does the Pope have that? No. That word all rules out forever the Pope. This thing has a lamb-like appearance and immense Legal power. Power of a system that's 5,000 years old. What is this thing? It's so big you can't see it. We've been, you know, we're not paying attention. Well, the clue to this identity is wrapped up in the first verse 11. And I saw a beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns. Now, Remember I told you the Bible interprets the Bible, right? If you go back to the book of Daniel, Daniel sees the beast coming up out of the sea just like John did, and he says, what is the meaning of these ten horns? And the angel says, the ten horns are ten 
kings. Amen? Isn't that what it says? If you go to the 8th chapter of Daniel, you'll see a fight going on between a goat and a ram. The goat has two horns, the ram has one horn. It might be the other way around. I get, I get those mixed up a lot. But anyway, there's two beasts fighting. And later in that 8th chapter, the two-horned beast is identified right there in Scripture as the Medes and the Persians. Medes, one horn. Persians, two horns. And the Medes and the Persians came up against this other animal that had one horn, and that one horn is identified as Greece. And, of course, history proved what that vision was way before it happened. The Greeks overthrew the Medes and Persians. Boom, that's how it happened. The Lord speaking through dreams, explaining how history would play out. But the point I'm trying to make here is that these horns also mean kings. Right? Now, in the Bible, in apocalyptic literature, when horns mean kings in one place, guess what? They mean kings in every place. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. So when we go into the New Testament time, and you see a beast coming up out of the earth having two horns, you know those two horns are two Brilliance. <laughs> the false prophet is not a man. It's a system of two kings. Two kings that have a Christian veneer, that have military might unsurpassed in the history of the world, have world communications to program the nations, and have a world economic system that supplants money as we've ever known it in the history of mankind. Now this is a rhetorical question. Who do you think they are? Let me take you back to the East India Company for just a minute. The East India Company was so atrocious to the rest of the world that the cries from the rest of the world came into the ears of the Queen and she disbanded the East India Company. But they only disbanded in terms of its military. They were the military arm of the British Empire. But the intelligence of the East India Company went underground and became known as the East India House. Then they became known as the Chatham House. Today, they're still in existence. They're known as the Royal Institute of International Affairs. One of the highest ranking organizations of the New World Order. Higher than the Trilateral Commission. Now let me tell you about the East India House, because it became the hidden authority of the British Empire. And see, you don't know this, because whoever hears about stuff like this, where do you hear about it? It took me eight years to do the research. There were some amazing people in the East India House. It was a huge think tank. Let me tell you who was part of it. Charles Darwin was part of the East India House. Karl Marx, the father of communism, East India House. Frederick Engels, his mentor, East India House. The teachings of Thomas Malthus. He wasn't alive then, but his teachings were alive and well in the East India House. He's the one that was in favor of eugenetics and race science and population control. Uh, some of the existentialist writers like Thoreau and Emerson, people that believe that man can transcend himself and become like God. The, 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 the uh, philosophy of the New Age movement today evolved from the East India house. Also in that house was a man by the name of John Ruskin. Now he took the pieces of their brains and took them into his own, and he began to believe that there could be a global British empire, a new world order that would, that would establish the ideals of this superior empire, but globally. And he would go out to Oxford and Cambridge, and he would preach to them about his dream about a new world order. This is in the late 1800s, okay? The new world order ain't new. And one day while he was preaching, his words fell upon the ears of a man by the name of Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes picked up on the vision and said, I'm going to give my life and my fortune to seeing this come to pass kind of like an anti-kingdom of God, beast. And uh, 
He created inside of the East India House an inner nexus of men called the Round Table. Maybe you've heard of the Round Table. It was a throwback to the Knights Templar. The Round Table became the inner think tank of the East India House. And these men plotted and schemed, and there were some amazing men. Rothschild was part of it, Milner, uh, uh, Alfred Balfour, you've heard of his name, the Balfour Declaration that allowed the Jews to come back to Palestine in 1917. He was part of the Round Table. Powerful men with great vision. And they figured out that if they could gain control of money, the God of this world, the mammon of unrighteousness, if they could master money and control money, they could effectively take over this country. So they figured out that the way to do it would be to usurp the powers of Congress. Because it says in the powers of Congress that Congress has the power to coin money and regulate its value. It's a power given by the people of the United States to the Congress. It's part of the Constitution. It's part of the Republic in which we live. They thought if we could just somehow find a way to get that money power where we could print the money. Remember fractional banking? We could, how would you like to be able to print all the money? That'd be pretty cool. Print up a billion. <laughs> That's what they do. They want to bail out Southeast Asia. Hey, Greenspan, print up 50 billion for the Y2K problem. They just print it. How did the British figure out how to do this? Well, they, they established the depression in 1907 in the United States that set the people up, and by contracting currency, there wasn't enough money to go around. So they fomented a, and established a depression in 1907 and set the country up so that they were cash poor. The government then was manipulated by a man by the name of uh, uh, Warburg. Warburg was a Rothschild agent sent over from England and he, he masterminded a bill that was written by brilliant businessmen on a place called Jekyll Island, of all places, off the coast of Georgia. It's a rich man's retreat, the Jekyll Island document. And there they figured out through two different documents. One was called, uh, the, uh, it was the, uh, I can't think of the bill that didn't pass, but they put it in as a bill called the Federal Reserve Act. Well, that's what happened. In 1913, on December 23rd, with only three members of Congress present, they voted unanimously to pass this bill while everybody was home for Christmas. And the Federal Reserve Act set up the Federal Reserve System, which is the American banking system, but it's not American, and it's not a reserve, <laughs> and it's not federal. <laughs> it's been given that name to deceive you. It happens to be a corporation. Now, the United States government, by law, cannot own a corporation. So who owns it? Good question, huh? Because the taxes that you pay on the interest, on the money that's lended out that we have to pay interest on and taxes on, where you spend five months of your life working to pay, goes to the people that own the Federal Reserve System, which is the American banking system. When you pay your taxes, it doesn't go to the IRS. It goes to, <laughs> it doesn't go to England. <laughs> Did somebody say England? It goes to the Federal Reserve Bank. So who owns it? Well, some of the richest banking houses in the world own the stock and make the decisions by putting people in office that do their bidding that determine the policy of the Federal Reserve System. So the Federal Reserve was effectively set up in 1913, immediately after debt was built up by starting the wars. Nations have to borrow money to build their war machine. And then after they blow each other up, they have to borrow more money to rebuild their infrastructure. So huge debt was created by the wars. When the war was over in 1917, the round table got Woodrow Wilson, who was president of the United States, and they set him up in office to go around the world and say, you know, we've got to quit these wars. Let's have a new world order, although they called it at that time the League of Nations. It was the first attempt politically to set up the new world order in this century. There were some great men in Congress that vetoed it. They wouldn't go for it. The rest of the world went for it. Woodrow Wilson did his job, but not in the United States. He failed, died a broken man, repented on his deathbed, and said, I've unknowingly sold out my country. Can you imagine that? When the league failed in the United States, the round table set up a western branch here in the United States. Only they didn't call it the round table here. They called it the Council of Foreign Relations, the CFR. Anybody 
that endeavors to be in political office in this country has to go through somehow connection with the CFR. It's the inner, it's the club that determines people that go to high places in government. When the Western Branch was set up in 1939, <clears throat> the Round Table and the CFR met to redesign the League of Nations, only this time they would call it the United Nations. When the war was over, the UN was set up in San Francisco, it's been moved to Manhattan and New York, and it was set up by Britain and the United States. Now, did you hear that? We said that this beast that comes up out of the earth has what? And the two horns are two what? And they look like a lamb and speak like a dragon. Is Britain considered a Christian nation? Is the United States considered a Christian nation? These two nations, these two horns, are the two horns explained on the false prophet that have set the world up for the new world order. This is a sign, an incredible sign, that fleshes out the whole concept of the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and mystery Babylon in our time. And now you can see that we're headed close to now the collapse that's going to set up the last phase of this system that's been in motion for thousands of years. Now, one of the great signs of the end is talked about in the book of Acts. It says, you will see signs in the sky in the heavens. Right? Doesn't it say that? One of the greatest signs of our time is the Hubble spacecraft. Because not all, you know, technology is amoral. It could be used for good or for evil. All right? The Hubble spacecraft is an amazing thing because for the first time we can look into outer space with having to go, without having to go through the Earth's atmosphere. They took a picture, this is awesome, they took a picture above the Big Dipper about the size of a quarter, billions of year, light years into space and guess what they saw? Literally thousands, not of stars, galaxies in the size of a quarter. In one hole in the heavens, 1,500 to 2,000 galaxies. And that's just as far as that thing will see. Who knows what else is out beyond that? Now think about this. They're recharting the heavens, and they found that there's over 50 billion galaxies. And this is what I'm going to leave you with. There's about 5 to 6 billion people on the planet now. They're saying that there's as many people alive today that have died throughout time. So if you took all the people that ever lived from the time of Adam all the way to the end, five billion now and all the way back, five billion, you'd have 10 billion people, right? Now think about this. If there's 50 billion galaxies and 10 billion people, that means every person that's ever lived could own Five galaxies. <laughs> you know how many stars are in a galaxy? About a billion. Our star system is about a billion stars. That's five billion stars. Our sun is a star. I mean, there are mansions out there. But you know what? All those 10 billion people aren't saved. And heaven's going to be empty with those numbers unless we get busy collecting people for Jesus' kingdom. The Lord loves people and He wants to populate. He said, I have called you that I might plant the heavens. He's going to plant us out there. So I want to leave you with that encouraging word. Thank you for having me. I hope I've helped you see our times.